Welcome everyone. Uh, I hope that you're having a good Drupal Camp Asheville. This is my first one, so really proud to be here. Really proud to be here. First timers represent. Um, yeah, I've had a good time, so I'm really happy to put on, and I'm thankful to be here putting on this presentation. So this is Reality Check. What will it take to decouple my Drupal site? Um, my name is Philip. I work at Interactive Knowledge. We're a small, uh, big-hearted web firm out of Charlotte, North Carolina. Uh, I've personally been working with Drupal since 2017, um, so really the tail end of the Drupal 7 years and into Drupal 8. So that's where a lot of my experience comes from. Um, this presentation is going to be geared towards people who have developed in Drupal. Um, it's not really going to be beginner friendly. Um, I'm kind of kind of talk about modules. I'm going to talk about Drupal conventions, features um, that you'll want, that you know about, and that you may want to employ in order to create a decoupled site. Um, I'm assuming you might have some interest in decoupling, maybe you're thinking about it, maybe you've already done it, um, but this is really just a presentation to, to kind of increase awareness of what work might go into it. Um, I will talk a little bit about site building and content management, it's not the entire focus, but if that's something that you're concerned about, I'm going to cover our experience with it and uh, what it might take in order to create that experience uh, for those users of your site. Um, so yeah, I'll expect you have a good grasp of Drupal, how it stores content, how to use modules, and um, maybe a pre-release work, worked with Drupal. Um, and I'll be covering some technical challenges and concepts, and then maybe a few examples. So, now that we're ready, let's just talk about the goals. Um, so, if you're thinking about decoupling, then you're going to want to understand the work required. If you build a Drupal 7, Drupal 8 site, um, you know, there's a lot of differences between them, but when you're decoupling, you're really taking on a bigger or a different type of task. It doesn't necessarily have to be bigger, uh, but there are going to be things involved that you might not plan for um, or that you might not think about the moment you start creating that front end separate from the Drupal back end. So I'm going to talk about what tasks are involved, what software might be involved, um, and we want to think about the things that Drupal provides to you. So I want you to take away knowing that Drupal provides a lot of great things uh, for decoupled sites that we can still employ in a front end and still gives us a good reason to uh, use Drupal as our content store and an overall application that has a lot of uses. So, um, uh, yeah, so I think we're going to have to, um, to, I'm just trying to give you a sense of what, what things might be involved. And I want to identify the things that Drupal provides, as I've mentioned, uh, to the front end application. There's a rich ecosystem of features, it's the API initiative, um, the things that are in Drupal are there to help us. Um, and then I also want to also identify what the front end application might have to provide that Drupal cannot. Um, and then should we have time at the end for questions, I would also like to hear any other experiences. If you build a decoupled site, I think uh, I'm not, definitely not going to be able to cover 100% of everything. So. Um, it's definitely something that we want to um, <clears throat> definitely something that we want to crowdsource. <laughs> All right. All right. So, what are we doing today? Uh, I want to present and discuss the developer's experience. So, again, I'm a developer. Uh, my work is with Drupal, and uh, we have de uh, decoupled a few Drupal sites thus far. Um, I think we've done three sites and one interactive kiosk, and we're in the a process of building a few other interactive kiosks that we use Drupal as the content store, but a different front end technology as the uh, user interface. Um, and then we want to start thinking about what we're going to do, what the developer experience is like. So I want to go over problems that are simple and problems that are complex. Uh, and I want to try to identify challenges that we've solved and that there are solutions out there for. And then I also want to talk about challenges that might be unsolved, that may make you pump the brakes on decoupling if they are features or things um, that you need uh, your users to have. And again, I want to talk about how these develop, um, affect non-developer users. Um, we're going to be talking in Drupal 8, so if you're still on Drupal 7 um, or you're thinking about going to Drupal 8, I'm really going to be talking about that. Um, we have done, I've done one, personally done one decoupled in D7. It's a little bit different than the site I'm talking about, so it is possible but I wouldn't re really recommend it, um, <laughs> at least at this point. So, um, And then I want to highlight and promote some of the modules that we've used. Um, a lot of the modules that we use are great. They make our life easier. And I'm a big proponent of free and open source uh, software. Um, and I think that if we use not the same modules, but if we coalesce around modules, we can make them better by contributing using submitting bug group boards. And I think that that's an important part of the Drupal ecosystem, as well as many other software ecosystems. 
Um, so I'll be talking from our perspective, my perspective, and our team's perspective about those things. All right. So who are we to talk about this? Um, again, I work at Interactive Knowledge. Uh, we have a few other team members around here from Interactive Knowledge. Um, but the IK team has um, is a web shop in Charlotte. We've been developing, I think, since Drupal 6. That's a little bit before my time. Um, but uh, we have a wealth of Drupal knowledge uh, going on from planning uh, to design to developing and content management. So we understand all the strategies uh, that we can utilize Drupal for. Um, and our, our team is ready for that. Uh, my experience started with Drupal 7 build-outs, you know, entire sites using the Drupal 7 PHP templating, um, you know, modules, hooks, and all those conventions. Um, and then we started using Drupal 8 around the end of 2017, and that's when we decided to take a dive into this decoupling experience. Uh, we wanted to look into newer JavaScript front-end technologies and see if we could bring them together um, in, a, in a way that would create immersive um, my application sites and platforms where we could plug in Drupal, but maybe other architecture or other applications and data as well. Um, as a team, we love building things. Um, we build content-rich sites. We build interactive experiences. Um, we're looking into alt, alter rea AR, uh, altered reality, and VR. And then we um, also are interested in data-driven experiences, so things that are maybe map-based. Got a lot of points. Put things on a map, as for one example. Uh, so we do like to use Drupal for all of these uh, things, and it's a valuable tool for us. All right, so you've probably been through this slide, but I also want to go through it because I think it, it's a good perspective on uh, what we're doing. So why decouple in the first place? Why are we even talking about this? Well, um, I'm going to break this down into two pictures. There's the big picture. Um, as to why uh, a community or a, a firm might decouple. So we might want to create a product which isn't a website. Um, so if you have a mobile app or a platform that isn't, um, that is more physically based, like um, just like a phone, but maybe AR goggles or maybe it's a kiosk in a museum, um, you know, those kind of platforms may not be suited for a traditional website or Drupal build because they may not be able to host Drupal on them. And thinking about that, if the app platform isn't going to run PHP, then that's a good indicator that you're going to use. You're going to need to use something else in order to connect to Drupal if that's the content store that you're going to use. Um, another big reason is that you can use uh, you can use decoupling as a way to run con uh, run different sites off of the same content. Um, so if you need multiple applications that access the same content, maybe it's unbranded and it gets rebranded for each site. Um, then you can use decoupling as a way to pull in the data that you need and where you need it. Um, so consider that you have a brand A site and a brand B site and maybe a kiosk C. They can all use the same content without replicating or duplicating your Drupal store. Um, so that Drupal store can remain the same, but you can draw content from Drupal uh, where you need it. And you can use the front end view to make it look at how you want it. Um, keeping Drupal. That's equally important. Um, at Interactive Knowledges, a lot of our clients um, really like Drupal, so they want to maintain that content store, um, and they want to use something that's familiar to them. So we often use, I mean, we often sell Drupal as a, as a good tool for them to put their content in, and a lot of our clients already have Drupal. Maybe they have Drupal 6, or maybe they have Drupal 7, um, and they want to keep it familiar because that's what their employees or whoever's going to, the site admins and the content editors, that's what they're useful, or they're used to. Uh, so we want to keep something that's familiar and extendable for them so when they have new requests, uh, you know, we can accommodate that like we've done in the past. Um, switching gears a little bit, um, we also get some front-end back-end separation. Uh, from a developer point of view, um, you know, we might have developers who are not familiar with Drupal at this point in time, um, but we still need to help get them integrated into system development tasks so we can have people who are strong in Drupal, Symfony, PHP, work on the back end Drupal side, we can have our front end take the view, consume the API, and then create a site off of that. So we can kind of get a separation of tasks. And I would say that as someone who's worked in Drupal and on the front end, it actually kind of is nice to be able to separate them and have a clear line of separation between stacks and technology, because sometimes it gets messy if you're working in the Drupal content store and the API and then you're trying to edit things on the back end. Um, it's kind of nice to keep those uh, different. And then finally, the API, API first initiative is maturing. Um, so that's a good sign that things are kind of not going to change a lot. 
It's not a bad time to decouple. Maybe if it was 8.2 or something, you know, we didn't have a lot of decoupling or all the modules were very young, but now things are kind of solidifying. Things are making it to core like JSON API, which just weren't part of core um, a year or a year and a half ago. Um, so it's a, it's a good reason to maybe jump in if that's something that you want to do now. Um, and the reasons that we do it from the perspective of IK, all of the above, I think, uh, definitely play into effect. But we also like to play with modern frameworks. Everybody, I think most people, developers, like playing with modern technology, um, new JavaScript, or, or even just things like AR and VR that we want to play with. Um, you know, it lets us use modern frameworks and keep and not have to worry about where we're keeping our content. Um, and obviously, we can use those new frameworks to create applications which aren't traditional websites. And then, um, again, like I mentioned, we have clients who use Drupal, and so we want to keep them there. So. So, I want to stress though, that I'm not here to evangelize for the decoupled approach. I realize there's some uh, skepticism, but I don't think decoupling is good for everybody. So I'm not going to be Dries up here touting the API approach. Um, and I think it's healthy to be skeptical. And so that's why I'm giving this talk, is I think that we need to think about what we're doing when we're decoupling, and what tasks are involved, and uh, make the best decisions going forward. So, I definitely don't think it's a solution for every site. Um, and there's definitely more than one way to do every project. So I'm just going to give a little bit of background on, some, on one of the stacks that we've used. It's going to help ground some of the examples and modules that I talk about. Um, and then that's going to kind of help me uh, center you around some of the challenges. So I'm going to assume that we're going to build a full site, um, a decoupled site using Drupal and a framework called Next.js. So basically, um, we're going to continue to use Drupal as our content store. It's going to hold our text. It's going to hold our files. Um, it's going to hold our. Um, the, the, um, it's going to hold like uh, organization of content, like menus, um, things like that, path names, and we'll get all that. It's also going to be our admin interface. So we're going to allow people to go into the back end and, and um, interact with the Drupal 8 content if they want things to change on the front end. And we'll see how that affects um, the way that uh, the site is built and the way the site works. Um, and then as I kind of alluded to, we want to continue to use Drupal entities. Um, we want to use Drupal um, conventions, modules, things like search um, that get put into Drupal and that we can use permissions, um, as I said, database, databases and indices, caching, and things like that. We definitely want to continue to use those. Now what we'll plug in on the front end is a uh, framework called Next.js. Um, in many ways, the front end is going to differ for every project. But just to give you a little bit of background on this one, Next.js is a server-side, so SSR, rendered React framework. So basically, it's a Node server, a lot like if you haven't used uh, Node or Express, it's a lot like Apache or Nginx. It's just a server. It runs on uh, server-side JavaScript. And basically, what that's going to do is our visitors uh, to our site, or the users, are going to interact with that server, and that server will send them back uh, React which is a JavaScript front-end framework, uh, a front-end library, and that's basically going to render the views. Um, so that's going to sit in front of Drupal, um, and it's what we're going to be interacting with if we're a visitor to the site, um, or someone who's going to use the uh, application that we're creating. <clears throat> All right, so, so, the, uh, so if you're a client, if you have a phone, if you have a web browser, if you have a computer, you're really, unless you're a content admin, you're really not going to interact with Drupal 8. You're going to interact with Next.js. And I'll, I'll highlight that in just a second. Um, another thing I want to talk about, too, this is kind of where your first decisions are being made right here. Number one, what kind of uh, platform are you going to use, Next.js? If you're using Next.js, um, or if you're going to decouple, number one, you will keep LAMP. And we like to use Varnish for caching. So that's not really going to change. You're going to need to account for hosting. Um, but Heroku is what we've chosen just to host the Node platform. Now, you don't have to use Heroku. You could actually roll it on your own servers, wherever that may be. You may have another, um, you may have another platform that you like better. Um, but for our, for, my, um, for our example, this is if Heroku just kind of is what we're using. So we, I may allude to Heroku, but it really could be anything. Um, you know, how else could you do this? You could have a client JS only. So maybe you don't have anything server-side rendered. Maybe you download the client uh, JavaScript library onto their browser, onto their phone, and maybe then it goes to Drupal and populates the data. 
Um, we also have progressively decoupled. That would be something where you embed, maybe if we're talking JavaScript, you'd embed it into uh, the Drupal templates. And then once that uh, browser renders the templates, it would also execute the JavaScript and do whatever the JavaScript is meant to do in a, de in a decoupled way. Um, we also have statically generated sites. I think those are big, um, those are very popular right now. I've heard a lot of Gatsby out there, but there are many others. I think that's just one that serves uh, React um, using JavaScript, but there are many in, in a lot of different languages. Um, they tend to be pretty popular, but that's not what we're doing. It's just an option out there. You've got your single page applications, mobile apps, um, interactive multi-platform applications, uh, like for instance, we've used Electron, which is another JavaScript uh, container that basically runs an application, not technically on in a web browser. All right, so this is just an overview of what we're doing. If you uh, had trouble conceptualizing on the last panel, this may help you. Uh, basically, if you are the user over here in the bottom left, you are accessing a site, um, and then the arrows kind of designate which way the request and data is moving. So if we ignore the uh, caching at the top and we just look at the bottom pathway, we have our desktop and mobile client user connected to the Next.js and Heroku stack. So that's our rendered JavaScript. That server basically takes care of things and sends um, sends the uh, views back to the user. So the uh, desktop and mobile user really only interacts with Next.js. Now Next.js, when it receives a request, it'll actually go to our content store, which is our Drupal and LAMP stack, and it's gonna go get that content and return it to Next.js, which will take the data, create the views, and send it to desktop and mobile. So this is really quite just a visual representation of, of what is happening. Now on our stack, we like to make use of CDN routes. Um, we like Varnish a lot uh, because Varnish is very well supported by um, Drupal. It had there are a lot of good um, tutorials on how to use it. Um, Fastly is, is runs on Varnish and then we also put Varnish on our servers as well to kind of speed up the, um, speed up the request. So that's what those pathways are from the top. Um, they're not really important to the stack, but you know, your stack will start to grow as you start adding things on. Because what, what you'll see in Decoupled is that the pathways of where this information come from just start going, just start coming from a lot of different places. And one that I didn't highlight on here that I think is also important to know is that in our applications, it is possible for the desktop and mobile device to connect directly to Drupal. Um, let's say that you're downloading a file. Uh, maybe you're doing some authentication. If you're, having, if you're offloading your authentication on Drupal, there will be instances where you actually go from your bottom left desktop and mobile device directly to your Drupal and back, or through the varnish caching. I didn't draw it on here, but it is important to note that sometimes these pathways, um, if you plan for them, can also exist. So, knowing this, our applications can grow really big and complex very fast. And I think this is one of the benefits to decoupling, is that basically what we can start to do is we can start to make Drupal one part of it, and then if we need sources of data from other places, we can start pulling them in through our front-end app. Um, or we can just start connecting things to the browser. Um, so if you need a client-side interaction like uh, chat, that's still possible in a full-stack um, Drupal. I don't want to say you can't do this, um, but this really kind of lets us uh, connect more things and send things to the client that just don't come from our, our Drupal stack. So, it's basically becoming a smaller part of the application. In many ways, you could be someone who's interested in plugging in Drupal to a stack that already exists. And I wanted to include blockchain there on the bottom right because we know that we really can't create a new app without blockchain these days, so you can definitely plug that in too if you want to decouple. Um, but in reality, I think I'd like to come back next year and I'd like a stack that looks like this. This is my Galileo Drupal model, model, or model of decoupling. So I definitely want to center this around keeping Drupal at the center um, and thinking about the ways that Drupal will drive our, um, Drupal will drive our ecosystem, so. All right, so let's get down to the nitty gritty. Um, essential Drupal modules. Uh, the ones that we've opted to use is JSON API. Um, it's our module of choice to expose entity uh, data to, uh, via JSON. Uh, the, there was a talk on it today. If you went, I'm sure there's a lot of information. Basically, what we like about JSON API is the schema is clear, um, and relation, things like relationships and data attributes are, are well-defined, um, and online, the, the schema is well-documented. So we can go to jsonapi.org and determine where all of our information will live, um, and that kind of... Um, 
is really nice, or is a really nice part of JSON API. Um, one of the nice things about JSON API 2 is the queries that we make with JSON API are really going to start replacing views for us in the front end. Um, so rather than worrying about views and Drupal, we're going to start to see areas where we can just use a query to get a list of um, entities or nodes. Um, and then we can paginate, sort, filter them um, with our query parameters. And then we can kind of replace that functionality on the front end uh, with a simple call to JSON API. Um, JSON API is also in core now. Um, it isn't the only module that exposes Drupal data, but they've added it since, I think because it's so popular and well supported. Um, and that's kind of one of the reasons that I would recommend it. Um, but one of the pain points is that it uses UUID as the entity identifier instead of entity ID. Um, I think this is designated in the schema, so you really can't use like your node ID to query for something. Uh, you could filter using node ID, but actually every um, entity has a UUID in Drupal, and so you kind of need to start using those um, IDs in order to query and call node data. Um, so one, uh, one advantage yeah. of that is you can create nodes with a UUID across Drupal instances. So if you're using a node API to go between Drupal instances. Yeah. So. Uh, yeah, what you said is that you start creating, um, you can start creating identical nodes across different instances. Yeah, that's true. And you can't and, control the node ID. Yeah, because if you have two Drup Drupal instances, you're going to have a node that has a node ID as one. You might have a, a, a different entity that has an ID as one. So the UUID kind of helps JSON API keep those separate because it, it, there are some pathways that you can use in order to tell it what bundle and what node type that you want. Um, but the UUID is a little bit more, um, is, as it's supposed to be, it's supposed to be universally unique. Uh, we're, I'm also going to talk about decoupled router. This is another very useful, um, this is another very useful tool that I'll talk about. Basically, it allows routes and path names to be exposed uh, via API, so you can call it using a REST, a JSON REST endpoint. Um, and then you can look them up to make a query. You can look them up if you have a path name like home, you can look up, uh, you can use a query and get that node and information about the UUID and, and some more information about the node um, from a translate path uh, endpoint. We also have simple OAuth. So if you're interested in do using user permissions um, and roles, uh, this is something that you can use in order to um, well, I kind of got ahead of myself, but basically simple OAuth will protect your endpoints. Uh, you can receive um, you can receive a token uh, using uh, the OAuth 2.0, I believe, uh, uh, methods, and then basically you can use it to elevate the requests that uh, your clients need in order to um, view content. And I would recommend using this if you need your application to create, update, or delete um, content on the site because you really don't want anonymous users to be able to do that. Um, another fun um, module are consumer and consumer image styles. Consumers really work with simple OAuth, but basically what they do is they create a scope that kind of creates your users and permissions. Um, and it allows Drupal to have setups where variations based on the consumer uh, allows very, Drupal setups to have variations based on the consumer making the request. So in the instance where you might have two sites uh, accessing the same Drupal, you may have different permissions on the type of content which they can receive, or maybe the type of content which they can update. So consumers basically allow your permissions, user permissions and roles, to be exported to the, um, be exported to your clients through a token that gets authenticated, and so their requests can uh, go through. Um, consumer image styles is another uh, kind of niche one, but we found that image styles is one of the harder challenges to do. Uh, but consumer image styles exports those image styles to your, um, you know, to, to through your API. Um, Drupal West RESTful Web Services. Uh, this is in, this is kind of the original. I have an alternative, but it is really the original REST API endpoint. Um, it was originally in core, and it exposes um, the REST UI exposes a form uh, that will allow you to export exposed entities to um, for you to. Um, get an update. Sorry, I need to re rethink. Um, um, one of the uh, best things about Drupal RESTful web services is it creates a REST export for views. 
Um, if you are using views, which we do for search, this is something that's extremely useful. It also extends serialization. So basically serialization, which is what you, you do to create um, JSON API or certain schemas, um, JSON schemas or even XML or other data types. Um, it allows you to, um, it allows you to um, extend that with plugins in your modules. And then we have uh, installation profiles, so not necessarily modules, but they are, um, they are site builds that have collections of modules and features uh, that may be opinionated towards uh, decoupling. Uh, we've used Acquia Headless Lightning, but there are probably countless others. And so they are important to note because you could probably start your decouple project with a site install that is, um, that's opinionated and useful to get you off the ground. So the first topic I want to talk about while I have time is routing. So this is the first challenge in a site, is offloading the routing decision making to the front end. So remember, we have the client hitting the express server on the front end. Um, normally we would have Drupal handle this, right? And so now we're all, we're, since we're letting Drupal handle content, page node content, and we want to display that in our front end, um, we need to have um, something that will translate the path names the uh, decoupled app is receiving so that we can get the content uh, from Drupal. Um, so basically, how will we know what content we can serve? Um, so basically, we need to sync the front end and the back end. So this is where the coupled router comes into play. Um, the module translates a path name. It passes, it, uh, passes the route from our front end Next.js application back to Drupal. And then Drupal returns that entity and node data so that we know what content and what node information that we want to display. Um, and one of the nice things about Decoupled Router is that it will also handle redirects. And that's something that's very useful. If you're using redirects in your path names and your path auto um, generator or it, um, if you're just manually setting those, Decoupled Router will handle those. So it's one of the nice things that, about this uh, module. Um, so, what was I going to say? Oh, and then, um, yeah, so the server side request will translate the path on demand. Um, yeah, it passes that in, so we already mentioned that. All right, so here's an example of, the, uh, of what the decoupled router might look like. What I really want to highlight here is at the top, I have the path um, a parameter all the way at the end. So let's say we're getting the home path from our Drupal.dev site. Uh, what we might receive back is just going to be a simple uh, object. What we see is um, JSON API information, such as the actual individual call. You would need to get information about that node. Um, and then we get some metadata about that node, the UUID, the bundle, the type, um, the ID itself, and even the full Drupal path uh, canonical there if you, need, if you need to use it. And this might be an older version that may look a little, little bit different now um, because there are some things that are going to be deprecated in the future. And it doesn't exist, you get an error. Yeah, if it doesn't exist, you will get an error. Um, it'll send back an object, but it will say, this does not exist. I actually can't remember if it'll send back four or four or an error, uh, but it will tell you that the pathway does not exist. Um, some of the challenge, though, of routing that we found when we're building applications, breadcrumbs. Um, if you're putting breadcrumbs on your site, that's definitely something where in the past routing on Drupal might be a little bit more helpful and intuitive to help you. But if your route, uh, routes don't follow a logical format, let's say you just have a, um, at a higher level, the route is a little bit different than a lower level um, uh, like a, a lower level uh, URL, uh, then you really just can't use the parameters. And you'll be doing a lot of um, checking for routes and to see if they exist. And sometimes breadcrumbs are menu-based hierarchies, and so that's also a challenge too, because it's really not about routing, it's just about where they are found in the menu. Uh, so we found that those are challenges. Uh, the node and ID um, routes are also gonna be a challenge. Try all you like, but your app is going to serve you some of the node NID routes, and so you're going to have to program that into your front-end application to handle those. Um, a lot of uh, fields and modules will expose that, like Linkit, um, field link will probably expose internal node slash modules, so it is useful to build that into your app um, to either redirect or somehow translate those and be ready for those routes, because sometimes they will happen without you knowing. You could consider stripping them all together from your content uh, if that's something that you think you can do. Also, you want to consider where your robots TXT and your sitemap are. Since those often contain routing information, you're going to need to decide if those actually live on Drupal or they get passed to the front end. And you're going to need to make sure that those pathways that are, if, if the sitemap is generated by Drupal, um, matches the front end entirely. 
Uh, so this is one of the challenges is syncing the front end to the back end. Um, so how can this improve? Well, if you're doing um, routing for the front end to the back end, again, the challenge is syncing things uh, so that the front end matches the back end exactly. Um, some of the ideas that we've thought of is maybe the information about routing actually lives on the front end, so rather than using decoupled router, or by using decoupled router, creating a file that the Next.js um, application only has to look at in order to, um, in order to continue routing. So maybe it doesn't have to make that request. Maybe the routes have already been generated uh, so that you can see them. And this is an just an example of maybe speeding up communication um, in the stack, which is very important. All right. Uh, another challenge is files and obscuring the back end. In our stack, we have a back end Drupal URL, but then we have the front end URL. Um, and sometimes we want to obscure that so that people don't see um, maybe our back end URL so that they know that they stay on the same site. Um, one of the challenges with this is absolute versus relative URL. So in your content, if you have things like files, which represent rep, uh, which reference something like sites default files, um, you're going to need to account for that in your routing and your front end. Um, it really doesn't matter if the images come from the back end Drupal URL because those will often be displayed in a browser or the application. But if you're serving files, they might see the back end domain, and you need to start to account to account for that. Um, so. Building in server routes that account for the backend files is, is something that we've done. Uh, using Express, uh, you can write a front-end solution to pass that, um, to pass that information uh, to the, uh, the front-end user just by passing through. Now, is it the most efficient? Not really. So you really have to start thinking about, do you want to obscure the backend or does it really matter? Uh, maybe, maybe your clients are fine if they go to files.domain. Um, and see that this is where the file repository is. So it really depends on your type of site that you're building. Caching. All right, so this is my favorite part of the site building is when uh, caching happens. Really when you have a slow site, you start getting towards a release and you cache, I think that this is the best thing. Um, we've thought about different methods of caching, and so when you're building a double couple site, you're gonna need to think about how you're also gonna cache that front end. Um, the three options that I've kind of conceived are you can cache requests in the front end, um, so uh, it, when you're making a translate route or you're going to get meta tags, you could have the app cache that in a Redis or a, a global object that it can reference, um, LRU cache, last uh, resource. Um, you could do something like that. You could also cache app responses like a CDN would. So whatever the Express server is delivering, the JavaScript back to the browser, you could just cache that as well. Um, so if a certain route is hit, yeah, it'll just already have that file stored in memory and can send it. And then there's also browser caching. This is a little bit more niche, but um, let's say that you have, I mean, let's say that you have an application uh, that is like a mobile application that exists on someone's phone that they downloaded. Maybe you're gonna need caching within that application or browser. So, um, and so you might need to um, store data there that's going back to Drupal um, and uh, quite periodically and often. Um, so in our app, we have a lot of uh, repeated requests. Um, uh, uh, sorry, I got a little lost here. All right, so one of the things that you have to um, consider, two things that you need to consider, uh, you have to make a few requests for each page route, so you need to get, if you're landing on a page, you need to get menu data, you need to get node data, views that they exist, meta tags, blocks, um, and anything else that might come from Drupal, so you're going to be making a lot of requests. Um, and does it make sense to cache frequently used Drupal requests locally. Uh, so where are the most requests being made and where should they be cached? Um, in my mind, it might, it, um, sorry, I'm just looking at my notes. Um, and we also know that Drupal has good caching mechanisms built into core. Um, so we've decided to use what we've got. Um, because of Varnish and Drupal uh, cache so effectively, uh, we've, uh, ju we just use it for our stack um, because it's so well documented and used. Uh, we've used Varnish in the past and Fastly, which is built on Varnish. Um, we, s we know that we can use the Varnish uh, purging in order to uh, store our requests. Um, so what we do is we take the cache tags from Drupal um, and we pass them to our front end header. So one of the nice things about JSON API is that it will pass cache tags from your JSON API along with your request, 
So what we have our front app do is grab those cache tags and then we serve them with the front end content as well. So if we're caching the back end, um, those JSON API requests will have cache tags stored in a varnish. If we have cache tags in the front end and we're serving that through a CDN, those cache tags will also be saved. And then what we can do in our Drupal is use the purger module um, to uh, keep content fresh if things are updated in the back end. It can invalidate the different levels of varnish caching when content is needed. And one of the things that I like, um, one of the things I like about using um, and in, uh, about varnish and caching is I like setting different cache expiry. One of the major problems that I've had, not necessarily related to decoupling, is just having uh, cache exist in the browser longer than you expect it to. So one of the nice things of passing through varnish or being able to uh, intercept the headers and change them um, is being able to uh, set different expiries at different scopes and levels of the, uh, of the application. Serializers. This is, another, um, this is another feature that you'll have to get into. Let's say that you're starting to write your own module and you need to expose data that might not necessarily be an entity or doesn't have entity support in Drupal, or maybe it's custom. Um, you'll need to start thinking about how to serialize your data. Um, so serialization is a core module added to provide a service that translates um, your object data in Drupal into a JSON format. Um, it doesn't only do JSON, I think it has built-in XML support, and you could really extend it to use any other data format. Uh, basically, it takes a PHP array object. Um, serialize is the a process of going from object to the format, but we also have some other terminology, encode and decode, denormalize and normalize for the intermediate steps that you may see or take um, when you're manipulating your data and working with it. Um, you know, sometimes you need that array um, so that you can manipulate it better, better than an object. Um, and like I said, core arrives with HAL, JSON, and XML. With JSON API, it extends that with another serializer. Um, <clears throat> Drupal REST, is, uh, like I said, is a JSON serializer. Um, I find that the best, the, the place where we have found the most use for this is in the search views. Um, search, you can do a REST export, but you can select the serializer that you want to use. One challenge that we found was that we would create views. We would have JSON API stored, we'd create views, but we wouldn't have a JSON API serializer. Um, so we actually ended up creating our own module and our own serializer. Um, and this kind of harps on another important concept that you're going to need when you decouple, is you're going to need to be comfortable creating and writing your own Drupal 8 modules. Because eventually you're going to need to get and expose data that isn't supported by the module ecosystem that you already have. So um, depending on your couple, decouple application, you may need to write your own format. Um, in our, in our um, experience, we've used the GeoJSON format. As far as I know, there isn't a serializer at this point for Drupal 8, so that's something that we would write in our own module. Um, and this is just an example of some code. I'm gonna skip it a little bit in the interest of time and questions. Uh, meta tags. This is another challenge. This is a little bit more of a decoupled front end challenge than the Drupal challenge. Uh, one of the things we like about Drupal is that meta tags are available. But what we found is that, especially with a server side rendered uh, application, uh, crawlers which grab the page aren't going to execute JavaScript. They're just going to take whatever they find, they're going to have the meta tags, um, and they're going to take those meta tags to put into their sites, such so as search engines and social media um, uh, that's sites. That's not so true anymore. Because Google, Google gives renders with Java. Oh, it's not? Clean. Well, that's really good to know. We were, find, we were finding a lot of trouble, and what no, we... I mean, yeah, that's only been like in the last year and yeah. a half or so, because yeah, I've done some PhantomJS stuff myself. Well, that's great. But that's good to know. I'm glad that it's getting a little bit better. But um, in, in our experience, and when we were messing with social media sites and sharing, uh, we found that we needed to actually deliver meta tags before, um, the, like with the first request from the client. So whatever the first HTML or JavaScript um, a package was delivered to the client first, that needed to include meta tags. But we found that meta tags weren't supported by JSON API. So again, we had to write our own module. We had to create a custom endpoint um, that was packaged with our core module that we send to all of our clients. We had to go get node meta tags. Um, we had to parse them, and then we had to serialize them into the JSON API format. Actually, I'm not sure if we used JSON API for that, but we ended up writing our own front end. That, that's almost fixed. There's a, an issue, a very, very long issue that I've been working on with the meta tag folks. 
Yeah. Have to do with custom serializers and you know, data levels in which they were serialized. So that's almost right. Yeah, and I will say that um, with regards to meta tags and writing your own module, there are a lot of, and to your point, there are a lot of issues out there that are trying to get data exposed. Like meta tags should be in a field, in a uh, attributes field or a related meta field in JSON API, but it's not there yet. Um, so oftentimes we take the initiative into our own hands, write our own module, spin it up as quickly as possible. Um, there's benefits to that. Things are faster, but we also know that eventually the support might be there and then we end up have to, having to write it all over again. So that's kind of one of the challenges with doing a couple applications is you might be doing things twice. If it doesn't exist now, it may exist later in your solution you may have to dump or you may have to merge it in with uh, and hope that the existing ecosystem solutions match your own. Um, so I want to go over some of the challenges that were complex and a little bit unsolved with the time I have left and then I'll see if we have any questions. Um, one of the things that we were not able to, um, one of the things that we were not able to solve is content preview. Um, this was a big challenge for us. Uh, we had a lot of trouble um, doing content peer review and because of things like content moderation and published and unpublished. A lot of times our site builders and clients would want to uh, have content, prepare it, and then they'd want to see what it looked like. And one of the things when you're building a decoupled application, especially one that might be read only, is that you're taking, you're just kind of building it assuming you're going to see all the published content and that you have permissions to. But what happens is, is that when things get content moderated, you know, and they're, they're in a draft status or need to review, they're going to require privilege requests. So there are a number of solutions that we've conceptualized that this is still a hard problem. I think uh, with the ecosystem maturing, it'll become easier. But basically, you should be expecting to kind of write an application that was going to elevate the API request and know to get the most recent, um, most recent, uh, um, you know, revision of a of a node or uh, some content that they want to review in the front front end view. Um, we've had some rudimentary work working with iframes. Um, which has been okay, it's not really perfect. Um, but if you want to consider it this way, iframes are just the kind of original way you could decouple a site. So we feel that that kind of matches um, the decoupling uh, ethos or, or whatever. Um, another challenge we had is related to content preview um, and is an unsolved and complex problem is using the design and layout. So as of now, there's the layout API which is available for site builders in a Drupal 8. Um, but we haven't found that the layout has been serialized, exported, or translated for front-end consumption. Now, if that's changed, that would be great news, but this is definitely something that's a challenge for us. So in our sites, we usually have the front-end design that we build. We show where the content's going to go, um, and then we let the client edit the content, but they really don't have any control over where that content might appear. It appears where we write it in the front-end, um, and that's about it. So I think this is something where if you are building a site that requires uh, a lot of um, site building or you, you want to give them a lot of options and templating, um, this is really kind of what I think is the wild west for us. We really don't know what, which direction we're going to go next and it's really an unsolved and complicated problem. Now there are some layouts that are available. I don't want to say that they're uh, not there if you want to use them. They're a little bit less, they're a little bit smaller in scope than a page. But we have entity view and entity form display. Those data do get uh, exposed via JSON API and the REST API. And then if you're using something like paragraphs, those are a good way to kind of help give your, um, give your site builders a little bit of control over what things might appear where. Um, and then uh, these used to be out of order, but this is very related to content preview. So I'm a little bit out of time. Um, I would like to... Uh, do some takeaways uh, just to kind of wrap things up and then take some questions or ha um, hear some other experiences. Um, so what should we take away from this if we're thinking about decoupling? Um, we need to consider our application's needs and our client's needs and deploy the appropriate stack. Um, there are lots of new technologies involved. Um, when we did it and we had to become familiar with deploying node apps on Heroku and that takes a lot of time and a lot of know-how. Um, so if you're going to commit to it, make sure that you know uh, what you're going to be getting into and what technologies you might have to learn. You're going to be writing your own Drupal modules. There are going to be things that don't exist yet. Of course, you'd be doing that for a regular Drupal site, um, but writing your own modules is definitely going to be important. Um, and writing your own modules and libraries on the front end to consume uh, what you may need to use on the Drupal schema. Web forms, which I didn't go over, are definitely one of those examples. 
Uh, you're going to want to be able to expose data in a custom REST endpoint. That, again, harkens back to writing Drupal modules. You're going to want to extend Drupal uh, with plugins uh, like the Serializer API. And then you're going to want to think about speeding up your stack with all these moving parts. How can we use things like decoupled routing and eventually caching to speed things up and get our data to where it needs to be? Um, so yeah, current and future challenges, connecting the admin experience with the front end changes, um, previewing unpublished and draft data, um, and how should we improve the overall site building experience? I expect that that's where we'll go as a team in the near uh, future, so I would think very carefully about those questions when you're working on a decoupled site. Um, and then questions such as should content admin be, be decoupled is something that I've been wrestling with personally. It's whether it should be its own application. Um, if you want to try out custom REST endpoints and have a written one, please look at this guide. Um, and then I want to um, also highlight some interesting projects. The Drupal admin UI was mentioned in the last presentation. It's a React uh, admin UI. It's definitely not finished, but it is an interesting place where you can find some example code for decoupling. JSON-A is good for JSON API. If you're using JavaScript, it will consume a JSON API schema and spit it out in a predictable object that you can uh, call um, objects and properties from quite easily. Um, I just saw this the other day. A Gatsby module apparently has a live preview, so if you're using a static site generator Gatsby, I would go ahead and check that out. That may have some site builder and content preview solutions for you. And then obviously the API first initiative, it is maturing, but there's always issues and things that you can check out there uh, to see what people are doing. Have the Gatsby people resolved? I mean, there's basically like an upper limit to the number of pages for Gatsby. Like if you get over like 500 or so pages. I have no idea. I personally haven't used Gatsby. Um, I don't know if there's a limit that you mentioned the 500 pages, but I. Well, it's not really I'm not a sure. hard limit. It's basically the fact that it takes, it can take like, it starts taking hours to rebuild the site. Yeah. I haven't used it, so I can't speak to it. Um, I'd like to open up the floor to any other questions, though. Does anybody have any questions or comments about things that you've done or, or stuff you've done with Decoupled? I'm just curious, because you talked a lot about you know, the custom modules you guys have developed, and how much of that you contributed back to the community, and is there a place where some of us can go and check out some of the things, because we're all hitting some of the same problems. Yeah, um, actually, that's something that we've been talking about, especially before we came here. Um, things like we've done with meta tags and other um, other information. Um, we uh, constant contact is the one that comes to mind. We actually uh, created a content constant contact module that's decoupled, and I know that my coworker Rosemary, who's uh, um, in here now, has been working on it. And so we definitely want to get back to the community. At this point, I think the biggest decision is: do we go with our own module or do we work within meta tags or JSON API? Um, to do it. And I think the answer is really to work within the frameworks it gives you. But for the things that were built, if we were to get them out faster, I think we'll just publish them, you know, on GitHub or on our own, like IK, our interactive knowledge branded, and just see if people want to use them in the interim. So, uh, but yeah, we do feel it's important. Again, I think free and open software is important. I just set up yep. my presentation. Go ahead. So, um, the site that I'm working on right now has just a pretty complex um, privilege, like user role, um, mm -hmm. privilege users kind of structure. Um, you mentioned, I think, the uh, OAuth module that would work with that a bit. Have you worked on sites where not so much content editing and content creation, but rather content consumption, reviewing of content is heavily controlled, uh, firewalled? Uh, so we have a, we're an association, we have members that pay, so, and we have different levels of access. Right. So the challenge for us in, in kind of looking at a decoupled model is it's, the, the privilege or the role check on users pretty really critical to the play role right. Well, uh, so the question is, um, the question is, have I personally worked on a site and what are the challenges with authorization? I guess I had to skip that because I was a little bit out of time. If I could allude to some things really quickly. Um, I personally haven't built one, but I can imagine the challenges. When we did authorized and privileged um, we did privileged requests. They're often slower because they may not be cached by default. You may have to make Drupal cache them or have special cache, uh, think about consideration caching. And remember that every request, especially if they have a use site, has, you know, it has to check the authorization of the token. Whereas we've built a lot of read-only sites where we can cache those things, but Drupal doesn't have to check um, you know, for headers and authorization. So I'd say one of the, your biggest challenges is gonna be um, how long is it going to, how much time are you going to be adding 
uh, when you decouple Drupal in order to authorize and get that data back out? Like how busy is your site going to be? Uh, Tangential to that challenge, you know, this is one of the instances where your clients need to kind of talk directly to Drupal. Yes, you could write your own, you could, you could pipe all of your requests and your tokens through your front end, but essentially it needs to get back to Drupal, right? Because that's where uh, your privileged and elevated content and your user permissions and roles live. So you also need to account for the fact that you're going to have clients that need to talk directly to Drupal and not really to maybe in our case, a decoupled server. And maybe, maybe, that's not a, um, maybe that's not a consideration for you, but it's definitely something for us because we kind of optimize the pathway to go through that decoupled server and then to Drupal. So authorization would kind of add another element of, uh, of data interaction in that stack. So I personally haven't, but that's some of the challenges that I think we would uh, come across. So we, we did a little bit of this. We were building an app in React Native. Um, we're using uh, JSON web tokens for authorization, which are slightly different, um, work decently well, um, and have Drupal support. But if you remember his, his map, he's doing caching at both, both the Drupal API layer and at the, the client layer. So I believe we were in a space where our application changed its API request based on what we knew about the user, right? So we're making just a different, like, okay, <clears throat> we know that this view path is content for uh, authenticated users, and this view path is not. And so, so per role, like per role yeah, on a, on a sort of role basis, we have a subscription model. And so, right. like that. so we, the only thing we know right now is like this is content that's available to everyone. And this is content that's available to subscribe. We don't have, we have like five. <laughs> yeah, I think the answer is you end up having to send different requests to different endpoints and making sure you secure those endpoints with proper authorization of your tokens, whichever token. Right. <coughs> so in the interest of the time, I'm going to um, get uh, let the next person go, but I definitely want to say thanks uh, to you all for coming. I want to thank our IK uh, Interactive Knowledge Leadership and Dev team who were essential in putting this together and doing all the work. Anybody who's contributed to free and open source software, whether it be on Drupal or any other um, thing that we've used, thank you very much. Thank you to the organizers. And then I also want to shout out Shardug. Um, if you're ever in Charlotte around March, we hold an unconference. I'm not an organizer, but the organizers are around here, so please um, come and visit the Charlotte Drupal community, and we'd be welcome, to, uh, be happy to have you. So thank you very much. <laughs>